Dear friends, good morning to you all, oh, good day. And uh, my name is Father Ben Alforque. I am a missionary of the Second Heart. And I'm a parish administrator of Our Lady of Perpetual Help here in Riverside, California. I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with you my own uh, basic preparations for the homily on the sixth Sunday in ordinary time. And as you know, the readings come, the first reading comes from Sirach uh, chapter 15, verses 15 to 20. The responsorial psalm is from Psalm 119. The second reading is from first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, uh, chapter 2, verses 6 to 10. And the gospel is from the gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5, 17, verses 17 to 37. So I would like to share with you now my uh, commentary analysis and commentary on the text, hoping that this would be of help for us all in developing our pastoral uh, homilies this sixth Sunday in ordinary time. First of all, let's have a look at uh, The first reading, and some background information on the book of Sirach, which probably would be helpful for ourselves and also for the people, for the faithful. <clears throat> the author names himself in chapter 50, verse 27 of the book as the son of Sirach. The date of composition is possibly 197 before the common era. And I use the word BCE, before the common era. Uh, it, in deference to other people who would not make use of uh, Christ as the center of human history. So we would say in the, new, the, the calendar, it's a common calendar that we use. So we say before the common era, starting in the year one. The original Hebrew composition was lost. Uh, maybe due to the fact that this book in Hebrew was not considered canonical by one side or one stream of the Jewish tradition. However, fragments were later found and they were substantial enough, probably about uh, two-thirds two of the material, of the original material, could be more. And they were assembled and translated into Greek by his grandson, probably in the year 132 before the Common Era. And this translation in Greek was accepted as canonical by the Christian tradition, but not accepted by the Jewish tradition, because, you know, for the Jew, God spoke only in Hebrew. And the name Ecclesiasticus comes from its frequent use in the primitive uh, church, in the prayer and reflections of the primitive church, the ecclesia, the preacher, that's why it's called the ecclesiasticus, used in, in the church. And the purpose of the book, of this uh, composition of Ben Sirac, was probably <clears throat> in 
to affirm or to reaffirm the fidelity of the Jews in the diaspora at the time to the law and the tradition of their ancestors as they were facing the influence of the Greek or Hellenic culture. So this means that the book of Sirach was probably written towards the very late part of Israelite history, probably, you know, like, of course, uh, during the Greek occupation, and as we know, 187 prior, uh, and uh, 135 before the Common Era, prior to the uh, conquest of the Roman Empire of Rome in the year 63. Uh, so we have this uh, period of transition, therefore, between the Greek Empire, Greek civilization, uh, Greek culture, going to the Roman culture. And of course, the problem was, how would the Jew, how would the Jew uh, maintain the integrity of his identity and culture, the integrity of his faith, you know, in this new uh, social condition where he, the, the, he was living in. And so this was really the exhortation of uh, Ben Sirach, this time from a, prof from a profound uh, wisdom tradition of Israel. They were looking now more deeply into the meaning of their life. What was it all about when they began to be a people of God and their desire to become a nation and then lose their nation in the, in the divided kingdoms and lose further their nationhood and their uh, temple with the conquest and deportation by Assyria, and then by Babylon, <laughs> and then by Persia, which probably gave them new hopes of being one people again. But the Israel and Nehemiah reforms could not succeed because they continued to pay tribute to Persia. They had no independence. And now the Greeks came you know, to control their land to introduce a new culture that resulted even in the desecration of their temple. And so they wanted to reaffirm their fidelity to the law and to the tradition of their elders. Now, let us look at the what it means to be uh, reflecting on human experience, human history, from the perspective of wisdom. Biblical wisdom is generally defined as a profound insight into ordinary human experience. For Ben Serak, the process of attaining this wisdom as a profound insight into ordinary human experience is gained, is done through experience of material reality, experience of material reality. And then making observation or repeating, seeing the repetition of this uh, experience of materiality all over and over again. And then coming up with reflection as a third moment. And in that reflection as a third moment, they go beneath the experience. They go beneath the repetition of this experience of material reality and gain insight. Aha, this is what it's all about. For example, the material experience of birth. And then the material experience of other births and growth, growing after being birth, give up after being born. And then celebrating, celebrating, remembering, observing 
that you know every year i remember that this is when i was born and that i have been through many experiences since then and then reflecting on this the experience of being born growth in life many experiences and having insight why did why why was i born what is the meaning of this uh, process of growing, an interplay of pain and glory, of good health and sickness, an interplay of joy and sadness. And the moment of, of my birth was also at the same time the moment of the possibility of death. So this is the process. And here in this process, Tradition plays a central role. Tradition as the sum total of experience, observation, and reflection of a people, of a community. So the, the, the experience now is not just personal. The experience now becomes the sum total of the collective experience of a people. And tradition here is to be understood can, can be understood more through prayer. To understand this tradition, the sum total of experience, observation, and reflection can be, you know, this can be understood more in prayer, in the quiet of our hearts, in the quiet of the people's hearts as they go into the origin of this human experience and the final destiny of this experience, the discovery of the living God in their lives. At this point, Sirach asserts that the supreme wisdom is respect and reverence for God as realized in obedience to the law, especially the implementation of justice and mercy towards the weak and those in need. Now, we will go to the uh, text. The text, Sirach 15, 11 to 20, really wrestles with the problem. Where does evil come from? And in this reflection, where does evil come from? Take note that we are talking of the Hebrew uh, person of the Hebrew community, of the Hebrew mind, of the Hebrew heart, <laughs> late in their history, going towards you know the, the, the towards the common era, so they had experience, as I said before, uh, being a people looking for land and life. And then they became slaves of Egypt. And now they were looking, they were slaves. Now they were looking for freedom and liberation, justice, you know, jobs and justice in their own land. And so they found that. And then at the time of the judges and the time of the kings, uh, the, 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 the time of the, the, their nationhood, the division of their of their nation into two kingdoms, and then the subsequent experiences of colonization and exile. And then they said, where does this evil come from? Evil as a negative experience. Evil as a denial of the good aspirations that they had, evil as the possibility of death, evil as the absence of peace, evil as the presence of hardships due to exploitation and oppression. Where does that come from? And the motivations behind this experience of uh, being deprived of food and drink and land and 
temple and God, where does that come from? In the later reflection of the wisdom tradition of Israel, as contained in the book of Sirach, Deuteronomy, the influence of the pers de Deuteronomic perspective comes to the fore, especially what we find in Deuteronomy 30 and 15 to 20. The perspective of the Deuteronomistic historian is to look at human life from the perspective of the law. If you obey the law, you will be blessed. If you disobey the law, you will be cursed. Good is obedience to the law. Evil comes when you disobey the law. When you obey the law, you will receive life. If you disobey the law, you will have death. So that was their frame of mind. But now, Ben Sirach brings that back to the primordial existence of creation. Recalling now the late writing, the late composition of the introduction of the whole Torah, Genesis 1 to 11. So Genesis 1 to 11 is proposed by Ben Sirach as the basis of this Deuteronomistic perspective, but this time within reflecting on this within the framework of wisdom tradition. And what was there in Genesis 1 to 11? I would like to this is this is replete. Genesis 1 to 11 is replete with stories and powerful images of human autonomy and personal choices between good and evil, between life and death. So that Ben Serak is really asserting that the possibility of good and evil is actually a personal choice. There is really a freedom of choice. In modern theology, we call this our Christian freedom as a fundamental moral option. Not just a choice of one among many things, but a choice based on what is good and what is evil, what is life-giving and what is death-dealing. God sees all this in the immensity of his wisdom, and he allows, he allows human choice. He gives in to the human choice, to the human desire. Because he respects the freedom of humanity and the personal choices, the personal choices of each. Because this freedom of choice is essential to one's human dignity, as well as to the quality and character of being created in the likeness and image of God. He could not possibly suppress our freedom our freedom of choice, because to suppress it would be suppressing himself, because his image is in us, and we are made into the likeness and image of God. And that is why Ben Serak says, it is not God's will that humans act unjustly. It is their choice. It is not God's will that they commit sin or they transgress the law, or they would be they would be apart from the law. It is their choice to transgress the law or to stay far from the law. In fact, God has already made these beautiful designs for humanity in the Garden of Eden. 
And the drama in Genesis 3 powerfully uh, presents to us, illustrates to us, this relationship between God and his gracious designs of harmony, of freedom, and justice on the one hand, and humanity's desire to give in to the voice of unbridled human appetite and autonomous sense of beauty, good, and life on the other. There was that fruit. You shall not eat of the fruit. The significance of that prohibition is that with the prohibition of God, the freedom of man was born. Without that prohibition, there would not have been human choice. Precisely because there was a prohibition, therefore one can make a choice. The birth of the freedom of man. And then there was that snake, the, the instrument, the, the figure, the instrument of, of temptation. What does that mean? Snake in the uh, ancient Mesopotamian culture, Egyptian civilization, symbolized three things. It symbolized life, and up, first, it symbolized fertility and productivity. Second, it symbolized uh, life and good health. And third, it symbolized uh, wisdom and understanding. And why did it symbolize uh, fertility and productivity? Because in the desert, when you are hungry, and if there is a snake in the desert, the snake will be your uh, Salvador del Mundo. Because the snake lives in the ground and it goes in and out of the ground. It plows the ground. And then the, the, the snake uh, gives away its waste. And the waste would allow the uh, sand of the ground to stay together. It's There's moisture there. And then grass can grow. So that when you're hungry, you can at least eat the grasses. Or when you're thirsty, you can lap the, the dew that is on the, on, the, on the leaves of the grass. Fertility and productivity. It is also... Uh, a symbol of uh, life and good health. Because when you were sick and there is a snake there, you will be saved. Because at the time they used yeah, the venom of the snake, you know, they, they, they took the venom of the snake and it created antibodies to, to fight off, you know, germs and bacteria and whatever and, and give good health. And if you remember, the, the, the staff of Moses you know, became the bronze snake. And then when people look at that, you know, they were healed. So, and also the Hippocratic, the, the symbol of the medical profession is a snake. And then it was also made use of as a, a symbol of uh, wisdom and understanding. Because the snake can adjust to its environment, to the color of its environment. Winter, spring, summer, or fall, all you have to do is call, and the snake will be there. <laughs> uh, oh, winter time, it has uh, thick scales, it hibernates, and then slowly on at the uh, springtime, it sheds off gradually its thick scales, moves about, gather food. Summertime, it has thin scales and it looks for food. And then on some on uh, a fall, uh, autumn and fall begins to develop again thicker scales and gathers food, saves food for the winter. And then you would know, oh, there's a snake. <laughs> you almost step a bit, you know. And why did the biblical author use a positive symbol in order to bring out the negative? 
before we answer that, let us look at wisdom's uh, treatment of the symbolism of the snake. The snake lives in the ground. We humans are made of the ground. Therefore, the snake lives in us. In every one of us, there is a snake. The question is, how big or how small is the snake? If So that we can control it or we will be controlled by it. It was like uh, Cain when he was tempted to kill Abel. And the biblical author says, you know, sin is at the door ready to devour you, ready to devour you. you know, sin ready to devour you. So it is in us. And why? For two reasons. First is unbridled desire. The insatiability of human appetite. I will have all the productivity and fertility of the land, never mind if people will die of hunger. I will have all the medicines and good health of the land of the, of, 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 of the of of the of the of the of the forest of the universe of medicine. Never mind if people die of their sickness. I will have all the knowledge of the world, and I can play the with the people at my fingertips, <laughs> manipulate them, because they don't know, and I know the insatiability of human desire, of human appetite, and brittled human desire, first. Second is the ambiguity of human goodness, the ambiguity of human goodness. You know, we think that we are doing good to someone, giving advice, taking good care of someone, and then somebody that someone says, you know, I know that you love me, but you know, I feel choked. Or you see a beautiful flower. Oh, this is good for the Blessed Mother Mary. So you nip it, you know, you cut it from its stem, and offer it to the Blessed Mother. And then the flower will slowly die. What kind of love is this that can slowly bleed to death its beloved? Or the bird, it's so beautiful, you put it in a cage to watch, to feed. And what kind of care and love is this that can imprison the beloved? The ambiguity of human goodness. And so it is in the sense that Ben Sira goes through the death of human experience, ordinary human experience, as an experience of Israel, and says, it is humanity that is responsible for breaking this original, pristine, intimate relationship with the divine and creation in the Garden of Eden. Therefore, never again should it be said that both good and evil come from God because of human freedom, because of the freedom of choice, of human freedom and responsibility. Now we go to the psalm. This is a terrific uh, psalm. Uh, psalm 119. Uh, this psalm is actually called an acrostic alphabet psalm. And some of its characteristics are uh, each stanza and its verse, each verse in the stanza begins with a Hebrew alphabet in progressive succession. So if you look at the picture there, you have Aleph, 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 Aleph. And then the next one, the next eight verses would be Beith, 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 you know. There are 22 stanzas corresponding to the number of the Hebrew alphabet. And each stanza has eight verses. What does that signify? Well, <clears throat> seven is a perfect number. And when you have eight, that, that seven plus one, making eight, fullness of perfection, fullness of perfection. So this is a sum 
that meditates on the fullness of perfection attained by obeying the law or loving the law or loving the law of Yahweh or loving Yahweh of the law. So, verses 1 to 2 talks of those who walk in the law are blessed. That still reminds us of the Deuteronomistic tradition. Verses 4 to 5, the law must be kept with firmness, fidelity. Verses 17 to 18, the initiative to appreciate the goodness of the law comes from the Lord. An insight, an insight into the origin of our capacity to obey the law. And then, <clears throat> 33 to 34, speaks of the intimate relationship between the author of the law, God, and the receiver of the law, humanity. The gift of discernment comes from God. Observance and keeping it in the heart is our humanity's free response to God's design. So I hope that you can pray the psalm better now and appreciate the connection between freedom and law and God's love and our obedience to the God who made the law. Now, the readings go deeper. This time, we go to the second reading of the uh, letter, first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Now, it must be said that if it's very clear in the Corinthian, uh, the letters to the Corinthians, as well as in the uh, books, sociological books that uh, looked into the society of, into the community of Corinth, that the Christian community in Corinth was a highly socially stratified society, reflecting or reflective of the highly stratified Corinthian society. And Paul now is inviting and insisting to the Christian community in Corinth to appreciate divine wisdom as the far superior wisdom of all in the midst of this highly stratified society. What does that mean? In the Corinthian community, the greater population were mostly poor, unrecognized, powerless, uneducated, and unknown. They have no fame. On the other hand, only very few were rich, <laughs> powerful, and famous. And Paul says, you know, that should be a blessing for you. <laughs> that you are poor and simple folks and you don't have the fame and intelligence of the few. Because I come to you not with the eloquence of the orators, the wisdom of the philosophers, or the power and richness of those in the elite, but I come to you preaching in my humility, in my condition, Jesus crucified. <laughs> because Jesus crucified identified himself with the dregs of society. He is with you. But the few rich, the powerful, and the famous couldn't accept this kind of Jesus. They could, they could not accept that this impotent Jesus, this powerless Jesus, the, this Jesus who could not who could not save himself from the cross, could ever save the people. They could not. And so, only the poor can fathom the power of the impotence of Jesus. The rich 
the powerful and the famous. They could not comprehend the victory of Jesus, the victory of the death of Jesus on the cross. That is why Paul concludes what eye has not seen and ear has not heard and what has not entered the human heart, what God has prepared for those who love him, this God has revealed us, has revealed to us through the Spirit. In that sense, the, the, the wisdom of God is far superior to the wisdom of the people, the, the poor people in Corinth uh, found among those in the elite in their society. Only the poor and the little ones can recognize and fathom this wisdom of God. So I hope that with the second with this second letter of Paul, our insight now <laughs> into the person of Jesus, the Jesus crucified could now allow us to understand, to have an insight into the fact that our way, our way to salvation and liberation, our way to a better society, to a better life, is no other than the way of the cross, the wisdom, the wisdom of God through the way of the cross. Now, let us go to the gospel. The gospel of Matthew. Here in Matthew 5, 17 to 37, Matthew presents six formulas of thesis and antithesis. Do not think that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. A summary statement of the Torah. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill. But how, how would Jesus fulfill the Torah, the law, and the prophets? Right away, he presents these six formulas of thesis and antithesis. And the formula is, you have heard that it was said by the old law. But I say to you, the fulfillment of the old law is what Jesus is now going to say and do. In contrast to the hypocritical and shallow legalism of the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus will now present himself as the new authoritative interpreter of the old law, of the law. And Jesus now will interpret this law by inviting people, by inviting us to a radicality, to see the radicality of the law, to the radical fulfillment of the law, and to see the radical objective of the law, the law in its pristine and pure and radical spirit is always in the service of life, in the service of justice, in the service of truth and of love from the heart, from the heart. Jesus, by this formula of Contrast, thesis and antithesis. Jesus breaks the old legalistic interpretation and regard for the law and puts the law back to its central radical basis. The sacredness, the sacredness of the human person and the inviolability of human dignity and rights. He exposes and denounces all types of desecrations against the sacredness of the human person 
and the brutal violation of human dignity and rights camouflaged and legitimated by legalese and gobbledygook. In fact, he is inviting, Jesus is inviting people yesterday, today, and tomorrow, all of us in human history, to the, to the radicalization of our being human, radicalization of the human spirit, to look at things from its roots to its roots, to the heart of the matter, to live today the utopian vision of the gospel, to love as Jesus loved, a love without limits, a love that dares to suffer and die for the beloved with or without the law, or even against or beyond the law. We go to the heart of the matter, the radicality of God's kingdom. Thank you very much, and I hope that this presentation will be useful for us as a guide for our homily this coming Sunday, this coming weekend, the sixth uh, Sunday of Ordinary Time. Have a blessed day.